It has been 22 years since players first got to experience the virtual lands of the Forgotten Realms in the original Baldur's Gate. So while there are plenty of folk out there excited for the upcoming Baldur's Gate 3, they may not have played through Bioware's 1998 RPG gem. In this video we're going to do a quick recap of the main story beats of both Baldur's Gate 1 and Baldur's Gate 2. I say quick, you can see how long the video is, just in case you want to study up before Baldur's Gate 3's early access comes on October 6th. The Sword Coast provides the backdrop for the first adventure in the Baldur's Gate series, with Baldur's Gate itself being the largest and most populated city in the region. It's important to keep the world of Faerun, the Sword Coast and Baldur's Gate in mind, as players will be revisiting the world in its new form come the release of Baldur's Gate 3. The main story revolves around the in-world factions, such as the Flaming Fist and Black Talons, but mostly focuses on the main player character searching for their own ancestor in history, all the while thwarting a mysterious armoured figure. Whatever character you create, the story origins are the same. Being raised in the Fortress Library of Candlekeep, south of Baldur's Gate with your friend and first companion Imoen, and the adopted father figure of your story, the Mage Gorion. At this point in the story you learn that strange things are afoot in the realm, with iron production mysteriously halting, metal crumbling as if cursed by magic, and ne'er-do-wells scouring the land taking iron and metals as their treasure. The walls of the fortress monastery are no longer safe as bandits make an attempt on the player's life. Upon leaving Candlekeep with Gorion, you are ambushed by bandits led by the dark armoured figure from the opening cutscene. Somewhat gruesomely, Gorion defeats most of the enemies but dies doing so as the player character flees and reunites with Imoen, your first companion in the campaign. It's me, Imoen! This starts the first proper chapter of the game. And as the player makes their way east, they may encounter and recruit Monteron, the halfling fighter, and Zar, the mad human necromancer. Arriving at the friendly arm inn, you meet a mage called Tarnash, who quickly casts mirror image and attacks you and your party. Despite the name of the tavern, it's seemingly not that friendly. Inside, however, you will find two more potential companions. Khalid, the stammering half-elf fighter, and his wife, the half-elf druid, Jahira. Regardless of who you choose to accompany you in the story of Baldur's Gate, you venture south toward the town of Nashkel, its carnival, and the mines. While danger is still looming over the player and another attempt on their life will be made, the most important part of visiting this town is that you have the potential of recruiting one of the best companions in the Baldur's Gate series. Stand and deliver, that my hamster might have a better look at you. I am of course talking about the neurotic berserker ranger Minsk and his miniature space hamster Boo. You can, however, also meet Volo in the town's tavern, a character that we have also seen appear during some of the Baldur's Gate 3 pre-release gameplay sessions. A returning character of any sort gives me a glimmer of hope to anyone keeping their fingers crossed when it comes to being reunited with old companions. It is the kobold-filled mines that will be the next waypoint through the player's story, the chapter culminating in a battle against Mulahe, an evil cleric summoning hordes of kobolds and skeletons. Defeating him and taking his holy seal will begin chapter 3 as you make your way to Beragost and volunteer yourself to sort out the local bandit problem, with the potential of infiltrating the camp with the subtle ruse of offering to join them. Either way, the chapter will come to a close as you fight the bandits Raymon, Venkt, Hacked, and Britic taking their letters and making your way to chapter 4. The journey then takes you through Cloakwood, back towards some of the dark and dank mines in the pursuit of answers to the Iron Crisis. After battling your way through guards as well as Drassus and his adventurers, you may start the process of flooding the mines, although hopefully not before recruiting the charming dwarf, Yeslik. Before you escape, however, the player's party must face off against battle horrors and the teleporting mage Davayorn. Only after they are defeated do you retrieve the river plug and complete this chapter. It is here where you will be able to finally make your way into the city of Baldur's Gate, first meeting Scar, second in command of the Flaming Fist, the mercenary company tasked with keeping peace and upholding law to the northern half of the Sword Coast. I serve the Flaming Fist! You will also meet Duke Eltan, one of the four dukes of the city and leader of the Flaming Fist. It is he who will task you with investigating the Iron Throne, a shady merchant organization that is known for assassinations and having contracts with enemy states. You discover that this organization's leaders are in fact back in Candlekeep, the previous library fortress that you once called a home. Agreeing to head there and pursue your leads will have Duke Eltan teleport you back to Candlekeep and begin Chapter 6. As you gain access back to the keep and explore your once familiar surroundings, it appears things are not quite what they once were. Explorations find a previously unread letter from the player character written by your guardian Gorion, although finding this will also lead to the player's arrest, then being found guilty for a murder regardless of charisma checks and evidence and forcing you to be teleported to the lower catacombs that are teeming with the doppelgangers that now control the keep. 
All of this has been orchestrated by Saravok, the armoured figure that killed Gorion in the prologue and is now inhabiting Candlekeep with the rulers of the Iron Throne disguised as Koravas. I can't believe I didn't realise until writing this that Koravas is just Saravok backwards. How did I not see that playing the game originally? <laughs> Under Candlekeep you will also seemingly be reunited with Gorion, but it is in fact doppelgangers taking his form. Through facing the twisted forms of old friends, as well as enemy basilisks, eventually the player character is able to escape from Candlekeep and return to Baldur's Gate in Chapter 7. However, Baldur's Gate is now in the grip of the new head of the Flaming Fist, the corrupt Angelo Dosan, working for Saravok. Facing arrests and hostilities, the player is framed for crimes against Baldur's Gate, and you must find the evidence needed to clear your name and in return the city to peace, either avoiding the Flaming Fist or killing them. Through your investigation, you find that the situation has been orchestrated by the same armoured figure, Saravok. It is throughout your searches that you find out that Saravok is in fact your half-brother with machinations of godhood. Both he and the player character are Baal spawn, mortal children that are born from the lord of murder, Baal. To prolong his life, Baal would have his children sacrificed by priests in a bloody ritual in an effort to circumvent the prophecy of his death. This ritual, however, was thwarted by Gorion and a group of Harpers, an organisation dedicated to maintaining the balance between good and evil. While Gorion took the player character in and raised them, Saravok was left to wander the streets alone until he was taken in by the Iron Throne leader. His plan was to use the Iron Throne and the Sword Coast bandits to drive Baldur's Gate and arm to war, thus starting murder and bloodshed on a massive scale, and using that power of death to ascend up to his own godhood and assume the new mantle as Lord of Murder. Upon confronting Saravok, you'll be thrown into what is likely the hardest battle you've yet to face. Face me! Face the new Lord of Murder! But as you beat him, you will see the essence of Baal being snatched from him as it is pulled back into its domain. And thus ends the original story of Baldur's Gate, although the Siege of Dragonspear DLC that came with the enhanced edition of Baldur's Gate continues the story that ended in 1998. The expansion starts with you clearing out the remains of Saravok's followers, but in the weeks that followed Saravok's demise, all of your followers apart from Imowen have left, and there are rumours that the player character did not defeat Saravok for the good of the land, but so they could in fact take his place. But now, as the rest of his forces are being mopped up, the story shifts focus to a crusade called by a warrior named Kalar Argent, also known as the Shining Lady. Being sent north by a contingent of Flaming Fist soldiers, alongside warnings that the Shining Lady is making her way down the Sword Coast and is threatening the city, the mercenaries have orders to stop their advance at the Castle of Dragonspear. One of the early battles that take place between the Coalition from Baldur's Gate and Kalar's forces occurs along the river where Baal, the player's father, had been killed by Sirik, the Mad Prince of Lies, many, many years earlier. After the battle, the player will suffer a vision of Baal's death and burns the symbol of the God of Murder into the stone of the bridge. Something that, understandably, the surrounding soldiers don't take too kindly to. The party must then sneak into Dragonspear Castle to gain intel about the Shining Lady, although instead discovers one of her lieutenants, Herfanan, speaking to an unknown source. After some skirmishes and an assault on the Coalition camp, your party and allied soldiers attack Dragonspear Castle, trapping Kalar in the keep as her chief lieutenant, Herfanan, casts a paralysis spell over the whole castle. This conjuration, however, traps both allied and enemy forces alike, revealing Herfnan's true plans of travelling into the Nine Hells and unleashing his master onto the Material Plane. As the spell dissipates, Kalar and the player ventured through a portal into the Hellish Dimension in pursuit of their new common enemy, before Herfnan can unleash the Demon Belafet. This section takes place in the first layer of Nine Hells, Avernus, a location that we know we will be returning to in Baldur's Gate 3 after its announcement during Larian's panel from Hell. After the defeat of the Demon and Summoner alike, the Shining Lady reveals that her true intentions was to free her uncle from the Nine Hells, and that the Crusade was in an effort to revive him. As penance for blood spilled, Kayla remains in the Nine Hells to guard the portal. The player returns to the mortal plane to celebrate another victory, but that night is wrecked by nightmares and visions of being attacked by an avatar of Ball twisted from the form of Ski Silver Shield, as you defend yourself in a terrorized state. You awaken from the dream, however, to find Ski Silver Shield dead, stabbed seemingly by your hand, and with clerics being unable to revive her as her soul is trapped in the dagger that killed her. You are slapped in irons and dragged back into Baldur's Gate to answer for your apparent crimes. The discovery that you are set up by the Hooded Man comes to you as the figure himself visits in an effort to twist the player into obeying their murderous bloodline. 
As you escape into the woods, however, you are reunited with Imoen, although unfortunately ambushed and starting the story of Baldur's Gate 2, Shadow of Arm. Your eyes burn as a thin, acrid mist rises from the ground and envelops you. Your mind clouds, shadowed figures strike and fade away. Your companion's cries echo in your skull, and the world around you fades to grey. At the start of Baldur's Gate 2 Shadows of Arm, you awaken in the dungeon of the elven mage Irenicus, the main antagonist of Baldur's Gate 2 as he performs some less than savoury experiments on you. The being currently probing and prodding you with steel and magic was in fact the hooded man from the Siege of Dragonspear, completing the link between games. A side note is that in the original release of the game, Irenicus was of the human race, but was intended to be an elf. This small blip was fixed in the enhanced edition of the game that was released many years later. It is a familiar face that saves you from the bonds of captivity, as your first companion of the previous game becomes your first companion of this one. Imoen unlocks your cage and you move forward and rescue other familiar faces, unlocking Jahira's cage and goading Minsk with the loss of his beloved Dinahir into using his berserker rage to burst his open. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, you are a smart one. I understand now. While making your way past genies, goblins, and dryads, Jahira will learn of the death of her husband, another previous potential companion, Khalid. Throughout your exploration, companion Imowen would start to utter some peculiar dialogue, hinting that things may not be as they seem. Upon leaving the catacombs, you come face to face with Irenicus as he utterly tears his enemies apart with magic. Imoen casts magic missiles of her own, and for their use of unsanctioned magic in the city of Athkatla, they are both apprehended by the cowled wizards. As you journey through the slums of Athkatla, you meet Galen Bale, who will know how to rescue Imoen but needs a whopping 20,000 gold pieces in order to share that information. Chapter 2 starts with Bale starting you on the quest to earn that impressive pile of gold. And chapter 2 also contains one of the most important decisions in Shadows of Arm. Once you've gotten to the 15,000 gold mark for completing quests, raiding enemies and selling items, you will be approached by a mysterious woman named Valen, urging you to meet her mistress Bodhi in the Graveyard District. You will also be offered a similar message by Galen, reducing that 20k to 15 if you choose to meet him instead. These two paths will lead you into a decision you must take at the culmination of chapter 2. Go to the graveyard and meet Bodhi and choose the side of the vampires and attack the shadow thieves, or give the money to Galen and take down the vampires instead. Each party will offer you help to rescue Imowen, and only through making this choice can you progress the main story. Attacking the vampire guild will lead you to the docks and graveyard districts, finding guild defectors and killing them for their involvement with the vampire guild. You'll learn of their contact in the Athkatla graveyard, which leads you to the vampire lair. There you are faced with spiders, traps, golems, and more deadly encounters until you find the coffins of the sleeping vampires and drive stakes through the hearts of the hibernating beasts. However, killing the three vampires, Galar, Durst, and Lassalle will summon Bodhi. She is an extremely difficult enemy as only blunt weapons will work against her, but once you have wounded her sufficiently, she will flee. With that quest complete, the Shadow Thieves Guild will hold up to their end of the bargain and grant you passage to the island where Imowen and Arenicus are being held by the Cowled Wizards. In Chapter 4, there will be some changes to the quests and events depending on your allegiance. If you side with the Thieves, for example, the ship captain will betray you and summon vampires to attack your party. As you make your way through the island and to Spellhold, Arenicus will make himself known to you as one of the Cowled Wizards. And if Yoshimo is still in your party from the start of the game, he will also reveal himself to be working with the evil elven mage. At the climax of Baldur's Gate, you learn that you are a child of Baal, the god of murder. But it turns out that, like yourself, Imowen is actually one of Baal's children also. And Arenicus's goal is to drain that power from you through, of course, a magical ritual through which you will enter into a dream. In this dream, you will face a demon who will permanently reduce one of your stats by one. Very rude and you are only able to defeat it by finding Imowen in this realm between realms and facing Baal together. I have drained you. Drained you of the very thing that made you special. It is the worst of curses, and I should know. Through this ritual, Irenicus has stolen your divine spirit and has ordered the vampire Bodhi to kill you. You are able to escape through the labyrinthine corridors of Spellhold and are faced with a choice as how you leave the island, either via portal or by ship. Regardless of your choice, however, you will end up 
in the Underdark. The Underdark is a network of many huge caverns throughout the world of Faerun and Baldur's Gate, and inhabited by some of the most dangerous entities in the realms. It's a space we've seen teased for Baldur's Gate 3, but here as you escape the island of Spellhold, you get to see the first virtual glimpse of the bizarre landscape and creatures that call the place home. With a silver dragon, Adalon transforming your party into drow to allow you entrance through their gates, and tasking you with finding her lost dragon eggs stolen by Arenicus. Through the city, you'll be facing enemies and allies that you will again recognize if you've been keeping up to date with the Baldur's Gate 3 news. Both Mind Flayers and Githyanki can be found through the deepest, darkest areas of the city. While Mind Flayers are not the main enemies in the game, as they appear to be in Baldur's Gate 3, they are still an extremely dangerous, insidious, brain-infecting race. The main goal here is to recover the aforementioned dragon eggs, and doing so will teleport you from the underdark city of Usnatha to the surface alongside Adalon and right into the middle of your next large battle at the start of chapter 6. So now, back in the real world, the next step is to try to recover your soul and Imoens from Bodhi and Arenicus. Surrounded by elves, you must prove your allegiance and disdain for the evil mage who you now hunt to Commander Elhan. Doing so will secure you passage back to the city of Atkatla, where your adventure first started, and eventually to the graveyard where you may have first met the vampire Cabal who you now pursue. Finally, defeating the vampire Bodhi and driving a wooden stake through her heart will allow Imowen to reclaim her soul and venture on forward to the elven city of Sildeneselar. Once in the city, you will be advised to speak to the elven queen Elzami. You will be presented with the Talisman of Riflane, an elven god of protection and guardian of harmony, and be tasked with recovering powerful elven artifacts and symbols to allow you passage to the Tree of Life. Irenicus and his minions are found to be sapping the energy from the elven world tree with parasites. Killing these will summon Irenicus now that he has been cut off from the tree's energy. Upon delivering the final killing blow to the antagonist that has plagued you since you escaped the clutches back at the start of the game, his soul will be dragged down to the Nine Hells. However, you and your party die with him, and your souls will too be taken down into the Abyss. It seems that your fate is not sealed within these hells, however, as you are given the option of opening the abyssal door back to the material realm by offering up five tiers of Baal, earned by completing the challenges set in hell. Your actions in these trials may change the alignment of your character, with them potentially falling to evil, which means in the story of the game giving in to the dark influence of the Lord of Murder. You will in fact encounter the wraith form of the antagonist of Baldur's Gate 1. Saravok representing wrath, as well as the other demons of greed, selfishness, fear, and pride. Securing a tear from each demon grants you a boon, depending on how you acquired it. For example, in the Trial of Pride, sparing the dragon will grant 20% resistance to all elemental damage, but killing it will give your character 20,000 experience. Regardless of your choices you made, good or evil, the five tears will lead into the final battle against the damned Irenicus and his demons the toughest encounter of the game and a fight for your very soul. Delivering the final blow will see your soul return back to you as you continue to live as Baal Spawn. This is however not the end of the prophecy, with the story of your party continuing into the expansion, The Throne of Baal. After the battle in hell, you awaken to find yourself in a sacred grove of ancient gods after being refused access to the elven city because of your Baalspawn bloodline. This plane will be the start of the final unfolding of the prophecy that has followed your character since the beginning of the very first game. This pocket plane contains other Baalspawn that are all trying to kill each other, and also you in an attempt to ascend to the throne of the Lord of Murder. This area also contains the soul of Saravok, your Baalspawn half-brother and the antagonist of the first Baldur's Gate game, who is now available as a companion and advisor if you agree to give him part of your soul. Leaving this pocket plane, the journey continues in the city of Saradush, where you will meet Melisan and the leader of the town, Gromnir Ilkhan, who mistakes you for invaders and will immediately attack. When you finally confront Gromnir and defeat them, Melisande shares with you that the other Baalspawn besieging the city is in fact invincible and urges you to find a way to make them vulnerable to death again, something accomplished by finding his disembodied heart in the marching mountains. Continuing this path and defeating the five legendary Baalspawn will bring you back to the pocket plane where seemingly your task is complete, although the truth of the matter is that Melisande, who has been helping the dismantling of all the Baalspawn, is in fact Emilisan mastermind of the five and a high priestess of Baal himself, who was tasked with resurrecting the god of murder. But not only does she betray you, she also betrays her deceased god, as she desires to take the throne and ascend to godhood herself. 
This is easily the toughest fight of the saga so far, against a powerful mage and a cleric who summons abyssal monsters to fight alongside her as she saps the energy needed for her evil godly ascent. During the final attacks, when you're about to finish your story and she is near death, the celestial solar beings appear to grant victory to you. Your final choice is to either release all of the taint of Baal that you have absorbed during your fights with their spawn and allow the solar to remove all essence of the god of murder from the world, or absorb what is left and become a god yourself. Whatever you decide, the ending will be influenced by your choices and the good and evil alignment that follows through the game. And as your party makes their final comments on your actions, the final act of Baldur's Gate 2 comes to a close. And that, Ghouls and Goblins, is a brief overview of the main story arcs of Baldur's Gate 1 and 2, as well as their expansion packs. Now, expansion packs are what we had before DLC was a thing, for you youngins out there. Next week, we will be covering everything else you need to know before the Baldur's Gate 3 release, with much more content on the way leading up to the game, and of course, across its launch and early access development. So to be sure you don't miss any of that, make sure you subscribe to GameSpot.